Good evening and welcome to 16 by 9. One of the largest inquests in Ontario history is underway, examining why some students have to go to great lengths just to get an education. The inquest is investigating the case of seven students who died after being forced to move far away from home because there was no high school nearby. It's a reality for many families in First Nations communities who are left with a troubling choice, send their kids away to school or keep them at home without an education. Here's Vashi Capellos. Sometimes it feels like the rest of the world has forgotten you when you're in an isolated fly-in community like this one. It might be two hours by ice road to the neighboring reserve, or 10 hours to the grocery store. First Nations children are the fastest growing demographic in Canada, growing at 3.5 times the rate of Canada's non-Indigenous population. But First Nations kids living on reserves like this one have a questionable future. More than half of First Nations reserves do not have high schools, meaning if kids want an education, they have to leave home, often boarding with strangers, a risky move to make during difficult teen years. Some teens have left home and never returned. That's when I seen cops standing there. So we called for ambulance paramedics. That's when they told us that they pulled out a body from the river, approximately 18, 20-year-old native. That's when I knew that was him. In Thunder Bay, seven First Nations students who went there to study wound up dead over a period stretching from 2000 to 2011. We are gathered here in this room today because seven Aboriginal youth died while trying to advance their lives and the well-being of their community through education. It is one of the biggest First Nations coroner's inquest in Ontario's history. They want to know what happened, why it happened, and they want some assurance that appropriate measures will be taken. September 2015, Shonda Mamakwa leaves home, Kingfisher Lake First Nation, traveling 519 kilometers to Thunder Bay. It was emotional because I wasn't ready to leave my family behind. When her flight landed in Thunder Bay, Shonda's world looked different. It's like louder, more traffic. Hearing ambulances every morning or fire trucks, just loud. The thing Shonda noticed was not what the city had, but what it lacked compared to home. I don't know, honestly, there's like barely bush. <laughs> just, I don't know, I'm just used to being out in the bush. Alone in a new city, Without the anchor of her family, everything was strange and new. The culture is like different from comparing to mine. I miss having my culture food, beaver, caribou, moose meat, fish. I miss that. The federal government funds First Nations students wanting to attend high school off reserve, but doesn't keep track of how many students receive that funding. First Nations kids who leave home for high school have to make all kinds of sacrifices. The main one is boarding with a stranger. Let's go inside. Throw up games, sometimes, the washroom. Oh, this is my room, that's where I sleep. Being here in the city without your family, it's hard. Like, you're alone living in a stranger's house. You're going to school with a bunch of strangers. It doesn't really feel like home. 
not the same here. Living in a stranger's home is one thing. Learning to find your way around a new city is another. For many, it's their first time taking the bus. The transit's got me good, though. I don't know how to take it. There's no school bus for students like Shonda, so she takes the city transit. Two buses later, she arrives at school. Dennis Franklin Cromarty High School is a federally funded school catering exclusively to First Nations students from Treaty 9 communities in Northern Ontario. Right now we have 100 students, um, and they're from 23 First Nation communities. All these communities have no high school in their community, so they need to go somewhere. Jonathan Kakagamic is the high school principal at DFC. Jonathan knows that his school is the closest thing his students might have to home. You could never replace the parents. Talk, love, touch. That's what's the hardest for a kid. And at DFC here, we try our best to uh, give that to them. And our job is 24 7. The school may feel like a security blanket in a strange city. The students here seem to linger long after classes are finished and the sun has set. But outside the walls of DFC, the world isn't always so welcoming. I've dealt with racism here. I just feel like an outsider when, when it comes to after school hours. Racism against Thunder Bay's indigenous population has long been a problem. Shonda, at 15 years of age, has faced bigotry on more than one occasion here. The first, she was lining up to order some fries at the mall. She told me to move, and then she just called me a dirty Indian. Then, not long after that, another incident, during a volleyball match against another high school team. One of the girls on the first line called us savages. I was just like, what did they just say? Did I hear that correctly? To me, I take those words seriously. Not feeling welcome, some students find that their thoughts turn to home. The hardest part was being away from home. Leaving family back home and being on your own. You get this lonely feeling. Sometimes I just want to go home. It's hard. I miss my mom. It's just home. <laughs> Despite best efforts of the teachers at the school to protect the kids, they aren't their parents, and they can't be around all the time. It's not easy keeping more than 100 teens out of trouble. Six out of the seven First Nations students who died in Thunder Bay attended DFC. I think the biggest one that we struggle with is uh, alcohol. It's like any youth, the experiment. But with our youth, a lot of times, um, loneliness is a big factor. They uh, use alcohol to, co to cope. Usually when I go home and just like 
alone. I would always video call my mom and just talk to her about their feelings. But a couple of weeks ago, I was just an emotional wreck. Shonda's cousin, like Shonda, was studying far from home. In December 2015, she committed suicide. Shonda was overcome with grief. I was out drinking. As I was walking through, walking across the road, and uh, alcohol hit me there. And I tripped, and the car almost ran me over. And then the next day, it just hit me hard. Just wanted to drop everything and go home. It's incidents like this that keep Jonathan Kakagamic awake at night. We can't guarantee their safety or their, that they're going to be alive to come to school next day. And with our history where we lost six students, I mean, that, that weighs on us. And uh, that's why we need to very, be very diligent in ensuring that we look after them every day, all day. The school doors open at 7.30 a.m. and close at 8 p.m. It's a way to keep kids occupied and out of trouble at night. There's a bridge there, train crosses, they usually hang out there. When the last school bell of the day rings out, DFC dispatches two patrol teams to make sure the kids get home safe. Sometimes it gets a little stressful, but I like doing it. I think it's making a difference. Letting the kids know that, you know, there's people that do care and do want to see them be safe. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Have a good night. Have a good night. They also scour so-called hot zones around Thunder Bay. There's a trail that goes through here where they like to sit and hide out, sit and drink. And I'll take the flashlight and I'll walk down to the point to, just to make sure nobody's there. Tonight, it's 30 below with the wind chill. But Steve Johnson says that doesn't always deter teens from gathering to drink. At 10 p.m., the teams call every single boarding home to make sure the students are in for the night. Maybe give us a call once you drop them off so, so we know for sure. OK, thank you. If they're not, the patrol teams will begin a search. I'm not sleeping. I'm awake, thinking. And I struggle, so I guess go drive the streets. You know, if my, my son was missing, whoever's in charge of my son, I would expect them to keep looking. And we do. Tonight, Shonda arrives at her boarding home safe and sound. She's got something special planned for the morning. A trip home. Next, no money for schools. The level of funding that we have from the government is not comparable with provincial schools. We don't have running water and floors are freezing. You can smell sewage. As sunrise breaks on the horizon, Shonda Mamakwa's flight soars north over 519 kilometers of rugged bush, frozen lakes, and streams. Shonda left home five months ago to go to high school in Thunder Bay. Today, she's en route to see her family, a trip she's been longing for for weeks. The plane's doors open. A blast of cold air meets the face. The silence of the landscape fills your ears. And Shonda, the sleepy teen who began her journey three hours earlier, suddenly has a spring in her step. She is finally home. Home 
is a cozy place. The smell of freshly made bannock fills the house. Shonda's parents, Chris and Priscilla King, get the kids set up to do some family baking. Everyone seems happy to have their big sister back in the nest. <laughs> I was really looking forward to this day. Yeah. There are just times where I terribly miss her and it, yeah. Kingfisher Lake First Nation has 415 people living on reserve, and 155 of them are 14 and under. But not unlike many reserves in Canada, there is an education crisis. The primary school is falling apart, and there's no high school at all. When kids here finish grade eight, they have a tough decision to make. Stay here and not get a high school diploma, or leave home. I started talking to her about high school when she was in grade seven. And she, but she was like, oh, I can't wait till I get to high school just to get away from you guys. No one telling me what to do. <laughs> but as the time grew closer to make a choice, Priscilla was struggling with the idea of sending her eldest daughter away at such a young age. But what really got me is when I got that letter, that acceptance letter, I was so devastated. <laughs> she has just turned 14. She's only a kid, like, I don't know, I just couldn't picture myself letting her go on her own. I was a wreck for a few days, emotionally wrecked. It was like losing a loved one for me. It's, I can still feel it. <laughs> But believing in the importance of education, Priscilla has put her own feelings aside. I had to let her go. I had to find my way to let her go. Priscilla knows what it's like to leave home for school at such a young age. She had to do it too. She knows the challenges that lie ahead and worries about Shonda when she's in Thunder Bay. It's hard. Like, sometimes I wish it were easy for me to just pack up and leave. And just to be out there with her, but it's not like that. Just the way things are now in the city, the way our people are treated, and it's, it's not easy, like. I try not to worry every day. I mean, I, I try not to worry for her, but I do pray for her safety and well-being. Despite her fears, Priscilla says she wants what's best for Shonda, no matter how difficult it may be to say farewell to her daughter for the next few years. She needs that education. Like, what is she gonna do if she doesn't? There's nothing for her here, like, I try to, that's what I tell her, there's nothing for you here, but we'll be here waiting for you. You need to do and finish what you started. The prospects for young people at Kingfisher who don't get an education are bleak. The literacy rates on reserves like this are some of the lowest in the world. Unemployment is high. So are rates of poverty, addiction, and suicide. We have a lot of problems with drugs, drinking, alcohol, and domestics, things like that. Combined with all the social things that are happening in their homes, you know, breaks the, the youth and doesn't want to live anymore. It's, it's, it's a sad thing. We had, a, we had a, a, a epidemic. We lost, uh, I forget, maybe 10 in one year. We lost one uh, just recently, just early December. It was, Dramatic. A lot of them are just, I would say, not doing anything because there's no jobs around here for them. You either have to go, they have to go for education if they want to work, yeah, because there's no work here. 
But even if they do decide to go away, the education they get here at Kingfisher doesn't always prepare them for the challenges of high school. Not all students go out because of the level of education that they have here. Because uh, the level of education here is low. And a lot of time students, you know, they, uh, they have to decide and the parents, is this good for the child to go? Either they fail and, uh, you know, the kids might, you know, get depressed and come back. And that's the, uh, and that's what they have to think about before they can go out. Like if they're not doing well here, the school locally, and they're not going to do any better over there. Chief Mamakwa's son made that decision in 2000. He left home for high school, but struggled and came back home. Not long after, he took his own life. I have three sons. The middle one died of suicide. He couldn't handle the peer pressures and other things, culture, shock, and, uh, and uh, eventually came back. Couldn't handle it, I guess. It's a typical story, I guess for some lot of families up here. Chief Mamakwa will never know for certain why his son took his own life, but he thinks that improving education, having proper schools to go to, might help his community's young people. If we get a, a, a good school and an education center, you know, that space that's needed, maybe that's, that will be the answer. The federal government funds schools on reserves, funding that's 30% lower than students get in the Ontario school system. The level of funding that we have from the government is, is not comparable with provincial schools. And that's where we are stuck with all these years, for, for our community anyway. Current funding isn't enough to support Kingfisher Lake First Nations Primary School. The school was built by the community in 1973. Today, more than 40 years later, it needs some major repairs. It's 11 a.m. on a Thursday in February. It's minus 40 outside. School is closed because the heat isn't working in some of the classrooms. The floors are freezing, the desks become freezing. We don't have running water in the urinals in the boys' washroom, so the custodians pour water into the urinals at nighttime to flush them out. Kids, kids tripping in the rotting wood. It backs up under the school, like you can smell sewage. I guess we, we need shelving. I had to put buckets in here and get rid of the water until it froze up. I get calls from the elders and they're getting worried. I'm not sure how long the roof will hold at this time, so it's getting there. Kingfisher Lake First Nation might not have a lot, but they are proud of what they do have. Having just celebrated their 50th anniversary as a settlement, they've got gravel roads, a water treatment plant, they sell fuel, and have their own store. They even have an ice rink. Enjoying her visit back home, Shonda's out with her family to cheer on Dad, number 77. Priscilla enjoys this family time at the rink and tries to cast aside thoughts of what lies ahead. Right now, I'm only focused on her finishing high school. I had just told her a couple days ago, I don't think I want to let you go to college. That's, that's what I'm thinking right now. I'm not past high school yet. Looking at my little ones, I want to raise them in my community, in my home. I don't look forward to sending them out in the city. 
I don't even want to think about right, that right now. Next, the lowest literacy rates in the world. We see in Ontario District where the numbers are down at like 28 and 21 percent. I don't know where you could look in the world and find a literacy rate of 21 percent, maybe in Sub-Saharan Africa. Education in First Nations communities has been fraught for generations. From the grim history of the residential schools and the wounding legacy left behind, to the struggle for adequate education on reserves today. One of the most insistent voices in the struggle was a young girl from Attawapiskat First Nation on James Bay. Like all the kids of her time in Attawapiskat, Shannon Kustachin attended elementary school in portables. They were cold and infested with mice. The original school had been condemned in 2000 due to toxic contamination from a diesel fuel spill going back decades. It's hard to feel pride when your classrooms are cold. And mice At 13, Shannon launched a campaign to have a new school built. In 2008, after repeatedly being dismissed by the federal government, Shannon and other Canadian kids turned to social media to fight for safe and comfy schools. When I first met Shannon, she was just, uh, you know, one of the kids in the grade 8 class in this cold rundown portable up in Attawapiskat. Government after government just shrugged and said, no, we're not building a school. A lot of Indigenous youth internalize uh, the defeats and the negativity. Shannon didn't. She was like, look you right in the face. You're the politician. You're the white guy. Why are we being treated in such disgraceful condition? Shannon's work to get the government's attention would not be ignored. Shannon began to speak out to the media at conferences. Those younger students are still thinking that those portables are real schools. And on the steps of Parliament Hill. I think one of the things that Shannon did was she put a face to this generation of young people who are being uh, basically tossed overboard by government indifference and deliberate policies of systemic negligence. Shannon's became the voice of a generation of kids who demanded that all children living in Canada get an equal chance at getting an education. We are not going to quit. We are not going to give up until we are giving a new school. I watched her emerge into this articulate and inspiring young woman and um, unfortunately uh, she died uh, in a car accident at 15. I think out of her death, so many other young people said, hey, we've got to carry on, we've got to pick up what Shannon started. And so Shannon's dream took flight. It's a student and youth-run campaign to raise awareness about inequitable funding for First Nations children. I think 2013, the federal government finally released some of the numbers for numeracy and literacy rates. And we see in Ontario District where the numbers are down at like 28 and 21 percent. I don't know where you could look in the world and find a literacy rate of 21 percent, maybe in sub-Saharan Africa. And yet, this is what happened under the federal government's watch with the education of Indigenous youth. And if that was in a provincial education system, heads would roll. Hey, at Indian Affairs, it's just another day at the office. One of the non-Aboriginal children that we work with said, discrimination is when the government doesn't think you're worth the money. In 2007, Cindy Blackstock, Executive Director of the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society of Canada, joined by the Assembly of First Nations, filed a complaint with the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal. I was one of these silly, hopeful optimists who believed that uh, when it comes to children, when you, if you show the government, uh, that what they're doing is harmful, that they could do something about it to prevent it, that they would do it, and uh, they never did. 
The complaint alleged the Canadian government discriminates against First Nations children on reserves by failing to provide the same level of child welfare services that exist elsewhere. On January 26th of this year, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal delivered its landmark ruling. Federal government's inadequate funding for on-reserve child care services is discriminatory and that things need to change immediately. Dr. Cindy Blackstock is the executive director of the I thought finally these kids have a day of justice coming. Government underfunding of resources for First Nations children is an issue the government can no longer ignore. These kids know that they're getting less and they know they're not doing as well. We would have those same outcomes if we did this to any other group of children in the country. As a campaign promise, Prime Minister Trudeau said he'd commit $2.6 billion over four years to close the funding gap in First Nations education. He also earmarked $515 million per year over four years in core funding and another $500 million over three years for First Nations education infrastructure. 16 by 9 requested an on-camera interview with Carolyn Bennett, the Minister of Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada, to find out how the government plans to bring First Nations on-reserve education up to par with the rest of Canada. Our interview request was turned down, but we did receive this statement. Improving education in First Nations communities is essential for First Nations students for a quality education. I am committed to make significant new investments in First Nations education to ensure that First Nations children on reserve receive a quality education while respecting the principle of First Nations control of First Nations education. When I hear people say, well, um, isn't this going to cost a lot of money? I said, the other way to think about it is that racial discrimination against kids has saved a lot of money through the years. Is that really what we want to continue to be as a society? Can you see my head? No. It's not in that decision that lives are changed. It's in what Canada does. We need Canadians to look with both eyes at this and never allow racial discrimination to be public policy, because it is. Oh, no. Yeah. Hi!